It was really cool to be able to sort of walk where Jesus walked and see that uh, firsthand. We had the privilege of overlooking uh, the town of Bethany. Uh, we went all through uh, the city of Jerusalem. We walked down the Via Dolorosa. I actually almost lost my dad on the Via Dolorosa. It's a funny story. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about it if you ask. Uh, but uh, the reason why we almost lost him is because it was, it's like a very narrow street, especially in certain places, and still there will, there will be a car or two that will come uh, down that street. And so it's, it's narrow and congested, congested but also... Um, it's dangerous because there are booths um, set up down the Via Dolorosa uh, for merchants. It's uh, commerce, right? They, they know that we're tourists walking down through there, and so there are people uh, every so often selling trinkets and selling T-shirts and stuff like that. Now, I say that in context of Lazarus. Can you imagine the fallout of Lazarus being raised from the dead? Just think about it for a moment. Can you imagine that? I emailed you yesterday and, and said that everybody would have wanted a piece of Lazarus, right? Everyone would have wanted to interview Lazarus. What happened? How, how did this happen? What was it like, right, to be dead? Did you go to heaven? Right? Imagine the questions. But I'm also imagining the commerce. I'm imagining that in a short time, as the story goes out, because you remember that there were multiple witnesses. It was culture at that time for people to gather with the family. It was kind of a community event, and Josephus tells us that they would do so for seven days. So within that seven days, all of this happens. It's four days after Lazarus is put into the tomb that Jesus calls him out. So there are many people that were there when he was put in the tomb, many people that were there and saw him call him out. Can you imagine the rumor mill, the buzz that went throughout this region? Also, the timing is perfect. People are about to come together for the Passover holiday. Just imagine the buzz. I'm imagining that maybe there were some booths being propped up. Maybe there were some resurrection t-shirts being sold. Maybe even some Lazarus bobbleheads. I don't know. But there was very clearly a buzz, and not just in my imagination, but also in the text. See it for yourself. John chapter 11 and verse 45. You'll note this three times as we walk through this, that John will use the language of many. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed. Many people believed. Notice with me verses 55 and 56. As people come to Jerusalem for the Passover, many who come from the countryside to Jerusalem look for Jesus. They want to see Jesus. He's the headliner. Now notice with me chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. Notice with me how John underscores that it's a large crowd. It's a large crowd of the Jews that learned that Jesus was there. He was at Bethany, and they came to see him, but not just him. If you know your text, they come to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So, verse 11, on account of him, many of the Jews, there's our word again, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. There is no doubt that there is a buzz about Jesus. Now, add to this the fact that this is not the first time Jesus has been the talk of the town, right? You, you might argue that Jesus has been the talk of the town this entire festival season. If you go back to chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, you realize that Jesus was the talk of the town at the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. He was the talk of the town at the Feast of Dedication, and now here a couple months later, he's the talk of the town ahead of Passover. But then you also add to that, that the way John writes this narrative, he presents the raising of Lazarus as a kind of capstone event for all the other miracles. As he puts together seven particular signs, not just seven miracles, but seven particular signs, particular moments in which Jesus is declaring something. It's definitive. It's obvious. He's the Messiah. 
He is the long-awaited one. He is the Son of God. So with that, imagine the buzz. As people are gathering together for the Passover, imagine the talk. Imagine that there are people from Galilee who have come. And as you hear about Jesus raising Lazarus, perhaps they are saying, it. yeah, like I was there when he fed 5,000 of us with one boy's lunch. Perhaps there are people from Cana that are there. And they're going, yeah, I was there at the party, the wedding party, when he turned water into wine. It was astonishing. Perhaps there are stories that are floating around of fishermen who saw him walk on water and still a storm with a word. Just imagine the buzz around Jesus. He's the talk of the town. He's also changed lives. There's a Samaritan woman who met him at the well. There's a woman who saw stones drop out of men's hands that intended to aim them at her head. And then you've got this guy who was just recently dead. <laughs> he was straight up dead. Actually, I actually wrote that this week, and then I thought, eh, I mean, straight. He was kind of like straight horizontal dead. But now he's straight up alive. Amen? This is big news. The town is buzzing about Jesus. And Dustin, why, why do you emphasize this? I emphasize this because the evidence at this point is overwhelming. And you even see it among the priests. You even see it among the Pharisees. So check out your text, verse 47. Verse 47, it says, So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. You notice with me here that they acknowledge the signs. They don't say, What are we to do? This charlatan keeps getting away with it. It's not what they say. They don't suggest that this is all about smoke and mirrors and the curtain just needs to be pulled so that he can be exposed. This is not what happens. They acknowledge what they can't avoid anymore. The truth is out. He is the Messiah. It's clear. Now, they won't believe it. We'll talk more about that. But they are acknowledging that he is performing signs indicative of that reality. So they say, if, if we let this continue, everyone is going to see and everyone is going to believe. So they no longer contest the evidence. They accept it. And I think this leads us to further see the credence of the fact that the resurrection of Lazarus was a tipping point. The news is spreading. This is the buzz. Now, the question is, how will people respond? How will people respond? And this is a question that I put also to you. How will you respond, friend? So glad that you're here. But the question is, how will you respond to these eternal claims about Jesus? I want to suggest to you that there's really two responses that are revealed here. Some will respond in faith. And others will put up a fight. Some will respond in faith, and others will put up a fight. Some do believe. We've already seen it, but note it again for yourself in the text. Chapter 11, verse 45. Many who see what he has done believe. Many believed. Now notice with me the end of this section, perhaps better broken out here, in chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. This large crowd that wants to see Lazarus, out of them, many were going away to believe in Jesus. They were moving away from the system, moving away from the religious authorities, and they are believing in Jesus. They've seen enough. They've seen enough. Now, John is speaking of a broad group of people. We don't know what's going on with every single individual, but this group at minimum is saying that he is, he is clearly, clearly something special. 
Perhaps he is the Christ. Many are seeing what John hopes that his readers will see. Let's be reminded for a moment of John's thesis. Remember in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, how John lays out his aim. He lays out his purpose. He says, there are many signs that we could talk about, but these have been written. These signs have been organized for you so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. So the book of John is a kind of apologetic. I'm writing this so that you will believe, so that you will see that he's clearly the Christ. He's clearly the Son of God. He's clearly the Savior of the world. And I'm writing this so that you might believe. So the question is, how will you respond? John is saying, look at the evidence. Guys, look at the evidence. Give the evidence about Christ, the claims about Christ, an honest and a humble look. John is convinced that when you do that, the Spirit of God awakens faith. The Spirit of God quickens that heart to see and to believe. So, Jesus, my friends, is credible. He's credible. The question is, what do you think? What does your heart say? My question really is, have you given serious thought to this? Please think with me this morning. Don't just pass over this as another day to be in church. Evaluate your own heart. Evaluate your own mind. Have you given serious thought to the claims of a man who showed up in the first century, claimed to be God, and then proved it. Are you, have you given that serious thought? Have you given serious thought to the fact that this man, hailing from Nazareth as the son of a carpenter in the first century, flipped the world upside down, and 2,000 years later, it's still happening? His influence is still growing? Amen? Have you evaluated that? Have you wrestled with that truth claim? Have you you given serious thought to the fact that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, claiming to be God and then proving it, also fulfills specific prophecy that was given by God to the people of Israel centuries before? Have you thought about that? Have you evaluated those claims? Now, most of those are external, but I also want to talk about your heart and your mind. Have you listened to the still, small voice in your heart, perhaps in your head, that reveals your need? Where you go, I know that I'm not perfect. Perhaps you've encountered the law of God, which reflects His holiness his righteous standard? Have you evaluated the fact that you will die at some point? If Jesus doesn't come first, you will die at some point and stand before this holy God. Have you wrestled with the thought that in your life, there is no way you meet that standard? But rather you fall far short of that standard. You are guilty. I am guilty. We are not perfect people. We are sinners before God and His holy law. Have you wrestled with that? And have you wrestled with the fact that this whole record is about the fact that God has provided redemption for you? That this Jesus of Nazareth who claimed to be God and then proved it also proclaimed that His purpose in coming is to go to the cross and there die a sacrificial death, a propitiatory death, to be a substitute for you because he loves you. And in his shedding of blood, he offers remission for you. He offers forgiveness for you. So that even though you would say this morning, I'm not perfect, I never have been, I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness, I've recognized that, I need grace. 
and realize that he offers it? That he shed his blood to pay the price for your sin so that you could repent, turn from your sin to trust in Christ alone and be forgiven and free? Moreover, to be loved and adopted, to have a future and a hope? Can we say amen to this? This is glorious. If you know Jesus, all of this is going like, yes, in your heart. You're going, yes, this is true. God has brought me to that place. I have evaluated the claims of Christ. And I see that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is my Savior. He is my only hope. And I have cast myself on him, turning from my sin and from trusting in anything else that I thought might save me at one point, to just trust in Jesus, God's provision for me. If that's you, you're going, this is awesome. This is exactly what I needed, and I believe this. I trust this. But perhaps for you this morning, you're going like, I don't know that I've really wrestled with that. I don't know that I've really evaluated those truth claims. John's appeal here for you is that you would. This is his aim throughout this gospel. And I make this appeal to you guys this morning because of something that's very important to see in this text. It's this reality. Faith, my friends, is not automatic. Faith is not automatic. Why do I say that? Because we're talking about this in context of a whole lot of facts. A whole lot of things that the Bible is presenting as facts about Jesus. We're also stepping back and considering our own hearts and general revelation and special revelation and the influence of Christ. And we're going, these truth claims must be wrestled with. And perhaps you are convinced by that, that these are facts. I would say that they are. But here's the reality. Facts don't always equate to faith. Facts don't always produce faith. Let me ask you this. Have you ever heard someone say, or have you ever thought to yourself, man, if God would just write the gospel in the sky, like super clear, if God would just write the gospel in the sky, everyone would believe it. Or if God would just send everyone a mailer, maybe a three-by-five card into your mailbox, kind of spelling it out. If God would just do something really dramatic, then people would go, okay, I'm in. I'm in. Ever thought that? I've thought that before. Could I say this to you? Is there anything more dramatic? Just, Just hear me. Is there anything more dramatic as we have a little parade here? Beautiful children. Amen, indeed. Can I just say this? Is there anything more dramatic that you could concoct than Jesus in the presence of a crowd praying, listen to me, praying, Father, I thank you for what you're about to do. You've already heard me. And I don't need to even pray this out loud but I'm praying it out loud so that these people will know what's going on here. And so thank you, amen. Lazarus, come out. And then all of a sudden, you see movement coming out of that tomb. Is there anything more dramatic than that? Can you concoct a better scenario? Isn't that better than writing it in the sky where people might say, well, that was just like happenstance, right? That came off of a jet and sort of formed, right? Is there anything more dramatic than Jesus calling a dead man back to life with an audience? I would suggest no. What's the point? The point is, facts, my friends, don't automatically lead to faith. Because in this context, I would suggest to you that for many, for many, it leads to a fight. Some here put up a fight. If I could say it in a sentence, I would say it this way. With a self-absorbed and short-sighted mindset, some suppress the truth. And you see it in the text. 
So go with me there, verse 46. We've read some of this already, but I want us to see it clearly for our own hearts. But some of them, John writes, went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Jesus has just called Lazarus out of the tomb. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. They stated as fact. Verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. It's almost like the Pharisees believe exactly what John aims. If I can just show you Christ, if I can just show you clearly the claims of Christ, people will believe. It's like the Pharisees believe this too, right? If we let him go on, everyone will believe. Why do I say that? Why do I underscore this? Because they're wrestling with facts. But notice with me what they go on to say. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. All they're thinking about is the political cost that's possible. Verse 49, but one of them, Caiaphas, he's the big man in the room. He's going to come in and settle it all down who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Wisdom has entered the room. Verse 50, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. So Caiaphas says, you guys are worried about a political upheaval. I'm telling you, this is going to be politically expedient. This is going to be really good. We can work this out for our benefit. Now, notice with me what John then includes parenthetically. Verse 51 and following. I'm not going to spend much time here, but we do want to see this. It's so beautiful for our hearts. He did not say this. John says, of his own accord, but being high priest here, he prophesied. So he offers really an unwitting prophecy. Caiaphas here is, is not good-motived. He's ill-motived in this moment, and yet he says something that's absolutely accurate. He says something that's gospel gold, as John describes. Being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. But notice this, verse 52, and not for the nation only, not for Israel only but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. What a blessing this is. So, so John here is talking about the reality that Jesus would die a substitutionary death. He would be the final Passover sacrifice. He would make atonement for the people of God, but not just for Israelites for people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language, people that are scattered abroad that God intends to save, of which you and I are a part of. Amen? Okay, that was a great spot for an amen. All right, if you know Jesus, great spot. You and I are a part of that scattered number that, that Jesus died to save, to bring into one big family, one family of God. What a blessing this is. But in this moment, Caiaphas here says all of this in an unwitting prophecy. He says it while simultaneously suppressing the truth about Christ. But these guys are totally self-absorbed. They, they are so self-absorbed that they can't really wrestle with the truth claims about Jesus. But why? Well, as you note the text, verses 46 and 47, and also chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, you will find that these guys are jealous. These guys are fearful that they are going to lose their influence, their authoritative influence over the people. Everybody's going after him. You can see this not only here, but also in the entirety of the gospel record. They are so fixated on themselves and their role that they don't see Christ at all. Now, let me just pause here and say, friends, this also could be you. I really want us to wrestle with this. 
I don't know exactly where every person is in this room. This also could be you. Perhaps you're not thinking about Christ at all. Perhaps you're not thinking about anything cosmic at all, anything eternal at all. Perhaps you are, at this point, maybe even willing to admit this morning that you are kind of living in your own little bubble. It's your world and everything that's kind of just right in front of you. Perhaps you alone with your device are spending any extra time, any like blank space, filling it with Minecraft and Candy Crush and, and scrolling through social media or whatever. And you're not really evaluating your life in relation to eternity at all. Can I just encourage you? Pause here for a moment. Have you wrestled with this? That these guys were right in front of him. Right in front of him. And they don't see it. Partly because they are self-absorbed. But then, moreover, they are short-sighted. All they fear in this moment is political reprisal. They're not considering their own eternal destiny at all. They, they only are thinking about, they're obsessed with Rome they don't like the fact that Rome is there at all, but at least at this point, they have managed to kind of keep peace with Rome and allow Rome to have their little place in their region. But man, if this whole thing about Jesus continues to bubble up, then the Romans are going to come in and they're going to squash this and they're going to take over. That's their thought, right? And Caiaphas is like, is like, no, 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 this is actually expedient with regard to politics. That, that's their mindset. It's fixated there. Perhaps this could also be you. Perhaps you are fearful with regard to the claims of Christ that if you go all in, if you respond to the Spirit's drawing you to repentance and faith, you might lose a relationship. You might lose a job. Perhaps this morning you fear giving up a particular sin or a particular lifestyle. And so you have not wrestled with the eternal truth claims of Christ. Understand again, these guys were right in front of him. He was right in front of them. And so with their self-absorbed mindset that is very short-sighted, these guys suppress the truth. They suppress the truth. They see it. They acknowledge it in the text. He performs many signs. We can't explain this away. But they don't wrestle with it. They just suppress it. In this way, they're very much like how Paul describes unbelief in Romans 1. See it for yourself on the screen. Consider this in this context. These who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Now, Paul is going to talk here about general revelation, but if we can, just allow your mind to apply it to this moment with Jesus. It's been plain. Jesus has been plain. He has been clear. For... Verse 20, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse for although they knew God, he was right in front of them in every way. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They suppressed the truth. It's right in front of them. As this morning, it's right in front of you. Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior of the world, the provision of God for your sin, the hope for heaven, it's right in front of you. Will you see and believe? Notice in this text, I want you to see this. Be good students of the Bible with me this morning. Notice the tight connection that in all three places in this whole section, 
where you see momentum and faith with regard to Jesus, you have these guys coming in to suppress, all right? We've already looked at verse 45 through 47 like three times, but look at it again just to grab this. In verse 45, you, you see the articulation of faith. Many are believing in Jesus, and so they swoop in and they go, what are we going to do? We've we got to stop this. We've got to suppress this. But let's skip down to verse 55. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. What were they doing? Verse 56, they were looking for Jesus. And there was all this talk. Like, is he coming? Is he going to show up? Where is he at? But check out what happens. Verse 57, there they are. There they are. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. They're there to suppress. John just tethers them together. Now, go to chapter 12, verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came. They wanted to see Jesus. They also wanted to see Lazarus. But notice with me what they do. They decide in verse 10, we got to kill Lazarus, right? It's not just enough to kill Jesus. We've got to kill Lazarus too. He's indicting evidence about us. And so they're there, right? I just want you to see that tight connection. Anywhere where there is momentum of faith, there is this cause of suppression that the wicked one is about. My friends, God has revealed himself. The truth about Christ has been clear. It's been plain through general revelation, through special revelation, even, you might say, through internal revelation. God has made himself known. He's made himself clear. And yet, facts, hear me, facts don't automatically equate to faith, which is why I'm pleading with you this morning. My friends, this is why I'm pleading with you this morning. Evaluate your heart. Where are you truly at with Christ? Where are you? This is not new. We, we see it all over the Bible. You remember what happened in the story of Exodus? My friends, how that God sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Moses says, I'm, I'm here on behalf of God. I'm his mouthpiece. But he's the one true God. Let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. God says, okay, sign, sign, sign. What does Pharaoh do? Hardens, hardens, hardens. It's clear. Initially, it looks like maybe his magic men can compete a little bit, right? But then what does God do? He makes it abundantly clear. I'm God. I'm God. Pharaoh, you're not God. And none of these other gods, these pretend gods, are anything in comparison to me. But Pharaoh says, no, he hardens his heart. And so Moses says, okay, sign, 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 sign. Eventually, Pharaoh says, okay, they can go. But he's still hardened. Then he pursues them. But then just think about God's people. They saw all of those signs. Then God parts the Red Sea for them. They go into the promised land. But then when they get up against the promised land, they send 12 spies, Right? And what happens? Ten of them come back. Having seen all the facts about who God is, ten of them come back and say, like, it's a no-go. They're big. They're bigger, faster, stronger. <laughs> right? We've got no shot. But two come back and say, no, no. Do we know what we're talking about here? God has made it plain. God has made it clear. My friends, I recognize that I am perhaps overemphasizing this truth. But as your pastor, I'm pleading with you. Facts, even mentally recognized facts, don't automatically produce faith. Where are you at with the Lord? Where are you at with regard to Jesus? So, how about a story? As we consider this 
reality that the facts of Christ do often produce faith in many, but sometimes lead people to kind of put up a fight. How about a story that illustrates the difference? You guys good with that? How about a story that illustrates the difference? I'm glad you agree, because that's exactly where John takes us. Go to John chapter 12. See it there. John chapter 12. Now to get there, notice with me verse 54 of chapter 11. Jesus, after they designed to put him to death, not for fear of them, but because he knows God's sovereign timetable, no longer walked openly among the Jews. This is perhaps a period of days, maybe a few weeks. He goes due north to the hill country of Ephraim, about 12 to 15 miles north of Jerusalem. But then, ahead of the Passover, he comes back. And so, chapter 12, verse 1, this is six days before the Passover, six days before Good Friday, six days before Jesus will give his life as a sacrifice for sin. Jesus, therefore, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, pause right here for a moment. Why does John tell us this? We already know this. We've just read it in chapter 11. We know about Lazarus. We know that Jesus raised him from the dead. It's what the whole section is about. He tells us this because he wants us to connect it to this banquet. He wants to make sure we see the heart of thanksgiving around this dinner. Verse 2, so they gave a dinner. They gave a banquet there for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Now, there's a lot here, but just in short, let me say, in part, John is saying, and Lazarus is still alive. (laughs) It's been a few days, it's been a few weeks, and Lazarus is still kicking. (laughs) He's doing great. He really was raised from the dead. I want us to pause here, though, for a moment and consider this expression of genuine faith. This beautiful expression of genuine faith. And I want to encourage you, if you will, humor me. Don't consider this weird. I want to encourage you to close your eyes for a moment. Okay? Just close your eyes for a moment and imagine this scene. You're there in the room with Jesus and Martha and Mary and Lazarus. It's interesting that Matthew and Mark tell us that this banquet is happening at Simon the leper's house. So if you are are imagining this scene, you are seeing a table, again, culturally low to the ground. They're kind of leaned against it. And around this table, you've got the familiar characters of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, but you've also got Simon the leper. You've got Jesus' disciples. Perhaps you've got other people. Maybe the guy that he just healed from his lifelong blindness is there. But undoubtedly, you've got a circle of people that are just so thankful, so thankful to be in the presence of Christ. Can you imagine this moment? Can you imagine what they might be saying to him, expressing to him. Now, I wanted you to close your eyes for a moment because I want you to tap into your senses as you visualize this scene. Let me just read the next verse and then we'll talk about it. But I want you to see it. And if I can say this, I want you to smell it. If you would, see it and just smell it. Verse 3, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. This likely small place is now filled with the fragrance of perfume. Okay, you can open your eyes. I hope that you can see that there. Visualize this scene. Perhaps even 
smell, this fragrant perfume just filling the air. All of this, my friends, is an expression of faith that looks like gratitude. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Can you imagine what the leper might have said? I know what it's like to be an outcast. I know what it's like to have no hope. And you changed my world. Can you imagine the conversation around Lazarus? Specifically for Mary and Martha. I brought my brother back. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Perhaps even as the gospel writers seem to lead us to understand, there is an awareness of the heaviness that Jesus is walking into, that Jesus is preparing to die for the sins of the world. He's preparing to carry the wrath of God on his shoulders. And perhaps that's present in the room, even as Jesus acknowledges this ointment preparing his body for burial. This is a banquet of thanksgiving. These people are going, Jesus, we are so grateful to know you. And so Mary, likely in connection with Martha and Lazarus, it's probably a gift from the three, she doesn't hesitate at all to break this jar of very expensive perfume. We're about to find out from Judas that it was worth an entire year's worth of wages. Consider that. An entire year's worth of salary, of wages. She doesn't hesitate at all. She just breaks it open and she pours it out on Jesus as a way to say, you are worthy. They anointed in that culture as a way to symbolize honor, to show honor, to show thanksgiving. And so Mary, along with the rest that are present in this room, they are saying, Jesus, you're worthy. You're worthy of it all. We don't give two thoughts, two thoughts before breaking open this jar and pouring it out on you. You are worthy of everything we have. You are worthy of worship. They couldn't help, my friends. They couldn't help but express gratitude. And they couldn't resist an extravagant gift. I love what one commentator wrote when he said this. It is a beautiful thing when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match. When the value of his perfections and the intensity of our affections correspond. Let me say that again. It is a beautiful thing when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match. When the value of his perfections and the intensity of our affections correspond. So Everything about this moment is, Jesus, you are worthy. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our honor. You're worthy of our lives. You are worthy. But there's one guy in the room who sees it as a waste. So you see the difference in this story? There's one guy in the room who sees this whole thing as a waste. Check it out, verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So he kind of fakes like he's concerned about the poor. But John exposes him, <laughs> immediately exposes this guy. He's not concerned about the poor at all. Rather, my friends, he is a picture of unbelief. John tells us, verse 6, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used, he used to help, excuse me, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So this dude had access to the cash and he was pilfering it. He was using it. 
That's why he's concerned. He doesn't care about the poor. So what is this? He is an example, an image of someone who's self-absorbed, incredibly short-sighted, and suppressing the truth. This dude saw it all. He's been with Jesus. He's heard it all. He's seen it all. And yet, he suppresses the truth. My friends, through his own ruin, through his own eternal ruin, Judas suppresses the truth. So question, what about you? What about you? Have you honestly and humbly evaluated the truth claims about Jesus? Have you? Has God brought you to the place of repentance and faith? Or are you today still in this moment going, no? Mm -mm. I won't believe in suppression of the truth. You see the facts, I hope. What about your response? So John's entire aim here, along with this gospel, is to convince, to convince you and I to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and to believe and to have life in his name. And so I encourage you again to see and believe. And if you are a believer, if you are a believer this morning, could I ask you about the extravagance of your worship in conclusion? This is such a beautiful scene with Mary pouring out this fragrant perfume. I'm reminded uh, this week of the song straight out of the 90s. If praise is like perfume, I'll lavish mine on you. Till every drop is gone, I'll pour my love on you. Is that you? In your daily life? Are you throwing regular banquets for Jesus? Because you're reminded often of your need. You're reminded often that apart from him, you don't know where you would be. But he has lavished his grace on you. He went to the cross for you. He came out of the tomb for you. And he opens his arms wide for you for all eternity to be your father, to be your brother. He has lavished his grace on you. What is your response to him? If you know him, if you believe, will you not pour it out? If praise is like perfume, will you not pour it all out till every drop is gone? He is worthy, amen? My friends, he is so worthy. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. You've been so kind. Thank you for reminding us this morning that facts don't always lead to faith. Help us to be real this morning with our own hearts and minds before you. And so, Father, in this moment, I pray that you would save someone today. I pray that you would redeem a life today. Show them Christ, God, through your spirit, awaken faith. And I pray for all of us as believers, if you have changed our lives, God, I pray that we would pour out our praise on you. You are worthy of it all. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.